Hi there, welcome back. And today we're gonna to be talking about CSS. This week is all about introducing the third language of web development. We've been looking at JavaScript and at HTML, and now we're gonna add the third, which is CSS. So where you've been using HTML to lay out the structure of a document and say that this is a paragraph, this is a link, this is a bulleted list, this is a table, etc where we are providing semantic or meaningful information about the structure of a document and where JavaScript is focused on being able to write functions and loops and conditional statements and being able to produce dynamic effects within a web page. This week, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be thinking about how do I get my page to look better than it looks? How do I improve the style of how everything looks? How do I give it style at all? So every web page we've built so far has looked basically the same, a bunch of text, um, some blue links, and you know it doesn't look like a lot of the web pages that you maybe are familiar to going and looking at on, online. So we wanna try and fix that. We're gonna do this over a number of weeks and we'll slowly introduce different pieces of CSS. And I will, I'll try and show you how to, do, how to do things with CSS to get you further than just looking up syntax. So what I wanna do in these series of videos is I wanna talk through some aspects of the notes for this week. Please go through the notes and make sure you're familiar with what's in there. Um, CSS, as you're going to find out, is not a hard language to learn, but there's a lot of it. There's just many, many properties that have to be learned in different valleys and so on. In the second part, in the next video that I'm going to make, what I want to do is I want to do something that's kind of a fun way to, um, to learn CSS, and that is I'm going to take a page, in this case a page from The New Yorker, and I'm going to recreate that page from just a bunch of text. So how do we get this page here to look like this page here? And you know, we'll we'll talk through some of the different pieces of it. So in this week's CSS content, we're going to focus on text and color and um, those sorts of things. And then next week we're gonna we're gonna add in information about layout and uh, margins and the box model and so on. So we'll we'll come at this. Um, oh, oh, you know. We'll work our way up to it. Okay, so a couple of notes about CSS. It, CSS, as I said a moment ago, is not hard syntactically. You aren't going to struggle with it the way maybe you have with C++ or other programming languages that you've learned. Um, but CSS can be frustrating. <laughs> CSS is frustrating, at least to me, in ways that other languages aren't. And part of it is that CSS and the web in general are very, very forgiving. They're forgiving in terms of what they will accept. So they have high expectations about what's correct. So these are valid documents, this is valid CSS, but CSS won't crash your computer if you get the colors wrong or if you get your layout wrong, but it won't look right. And so we often spend a lot of time debugging CSS, trying to make things work, cursing at uh, the browser at ourselves because we can't make some design that we're trying to produce. We can't make it happen. So what I my advice to you with CSS, as with many things, is take it slow and really try and understand the principles of what's happening. If you try and Google your way or Stack Overflow your way to solve these problems, you're going to get frustrated because if you don't really understand what's going on, people solve the same problem in CSS many different ways. And so you may be importing a piece of what one project has done and a piece of what another project has done, and they may not come together and do what you want. So I'm gonna show you how to debug, how to, I'm a big proponent of using the developer tools and really knowing how to manipulate what's going on in the page that way. So we're gonna spend a bunch of time talking about those things. But the last thing I would encourage you to do, and I'm gonna do some of it today, is I want you to be curious. If you wanna be a good web developer, you need to go and look at what other web developers are doing. And the, the beautiful thing with the web is that we can view the source of other people's pages. We can go and see how they built what they built, 
How did they do their CSS? How did they achieve this effect? So I'm not encouraging you to go and steal from other websites or to just lift code out of them. We can't do that. But I am encouraging you to go and study how they work and take a look at how they've implemented the pieces of what they have. And so we're going to do a bunch of that today. Okay, so before we begin, I want to take you through an example. It's quite a, it's, it's getting to be a bit of a dated example now, but I still, it's something that I still really love, and that is the CSS Zen Garden. So this was an effort to create a single HTML page, like the pages that we've been creating, and then ask designers and people who are doing CSS development to take this HTML page and without changing anything in the HTML page, make the page look different. So if I were to show you the web page, let's just take a look at it. Here is the, the CSS Zen Garden HTML, and I've linked to it in the notes as well. And basically what you have, if you look at the, if you look at the HTML, we have a body tag, we have a div, we have sections, header, h1, h2, paragraphs, etc. And you can see that throughout this, they're using lots of IDs. They're using lots of classes. And sometimes you'll note, uh, let me find a good example right here on line 78. You'll see them using multiple classes. So we're gonna talk all about this in, in relation to CSS. When we were talking about DOM programming, we said that being able to query selector query into the document and get an element or a, a list of elements using selectors was really important. And we did it with IDs, tag names, classes, etc. So essentially what we have here is we have a document that's been laid out. The document is, for all intents and purposes, it's frozen. This is what the document looks like. So what people have to do is take this document and reimagine it. But the only thing they can do is they can change the CSS. Okay, so here's the, here's the original document. Here's our first uh, sample of another, another style of how you could do this document. A modern style. If I scroll down, you can see lots of interesting things going on here with layout. So instead of having everything just flow you know, over at the left-hand side and, and down, they're changing where things are positioned. Lots of bold colors, interesting use of images, lots of layering, right? So same page semantically, same page content wise, but a completely different page. Like look at this text going vertically, um, playing with all sorts of things. Look, the links look totally different, etc. Okay. Here's the exact same page, same HTML. Again, this time not looking modern, but looking like an old style, um, like a poster or something like this. Very, very different. Playing with lots of different fonts, you can see how much the shape of the shape, the size, the how dark, etc. The text is is really a big part of this design. Graphics, working with columns, etc. Really, really different. Here's a third. This one's laid out more like. Um, like a magazine cover would have would have been, or has that feel to it. Lots of colors, interesting things with layout. Here's another one. Totally different. Whimsical. Um, I think if I refresh this, there's an animation. Yeah, the robot comes sliding in. You know, you've got playful colors. You have a very different take on the layout. You have this parallax. Uh, style going on where the background is sort of fixed but it's further behind and you're scrolling in front of it and so you can just bear, you know just see that robot there in the background so all of those and there's hundreds of other ones that you could go and look at I think they are an interesting example when you're starting to think about what is the what is the role of CSS in the page CSS doesn't define the content although it shapes our experience of the content so when I'm trying to build something, my first, the first thing I need to do is I need to figure out how I am going to lay out my content as a series of elements in the DOM 
what semantic elements am I going to choose? Am I going to choose a header, a paragraph, a heading one, etc.? And and how am I going to connect this HTML so that it's something that I can style? How do I provide hooks into the into the DOM so that I can layer on color and different fonts and images and all different layouts and so on. So this is what the role of CSS is. But CSS, since the CSSN garden, has continued to evolve. CSS has gained all sorts of new features and people do crazy things with it. Like here's a really beautiful example. This is a painting like just done in CSS. So this isn't an image. Everything you're seeing there is all being done with CSS styles, just doing divs and elements and so on in the page and then making all that happen. This, this is unbelievable, you know, to be able to take CSS and push it this far. And people, people do amazing, amazing things with CSS. But it's one of these technologies where when you're getting started with it, your own CSS is going to feel like, why can I not get this? Uh, text to be centered? Why can I not get this to be the size that I want? Why can somebody paint a painting in CSS and I'm struggling to get an underline on uh, this text right here? So let's go through and, and talk about how you, how you get there. And I'm just going to pick up on a few of the ideas that are in these notes that I think are worth especially calling out. And then as I say, my goal is I want to, I want to take everything that we're talking about this week and I want to turn this into this. Okay, so that's that's sort of our goal. That's where we're headed. Okay, so the the basics of the syntax that you need to understand, and I, as I say, CSS is not difficult syntax when you're coming from all the other languages that you've already learned. We need to be able to specify a series of rules that we want to apply. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to say that a particular set of elements we want them to be selected. Select these elements in the DOM or select this element, singular or plural, in the DOM. And I want to apply a series of CSS rules to it. I want to say, for example, that all H1 elements in my page, I want the color of those to be blue. Okay, so the way that these are designed, as is so much of the web is designed this way, is with key value pairs. So I have a property name like color. And when you're doing CSS, you have to um, forego your Canadian spelling of everything. So it's color with no U, center, ER, as opposed to RE. There's all these different things that you'll have to make sure that you uh, Americanize your, your spelling. So color blue, font size 12, pixels, etc. So another thing syntactically that you're going to run into that's different in CSS when you're moving between JavaScript and CSS is that CSS uses so-called kebab case where I have font dash size as opposed to camel case where I would say font capital S, font capital S size in order to do it. The whole thing ends in a semicolon. So I have semicolons at the end. And to be honest, this is one of the reasons why I think it's useful when you're learning JavaScript, even though JavaScript doesn't require you to include semicolons, I think you should always include semicolons because when you're moving back and forth between all the different languages you have to do, C++, C, Java, and then when you're coming to CSS, it's very common that you need to keep the, the end of line terminator as a semicolon. So here we have to do it in CSS. So this is one of the reasons I would encourage you to keep doing it when you're doing it inside of inside of JavaScript. Okay, so here's another example here. I want to specify that all the paragraph elements in my page, I want all of these paragraph elements in my page to have these particular styles applied to them. I want their color, their text alignment, the text decoration. I want all of those things to be specified. So we're going to talk a lot about what the different properties are and the kinds of things that you can set. But for the moment, what I want to do is I just want to talk to you about where you actually put all of this CSS. So really, that's, I mean, there's more to CSS, but not a ton more. It is a selector or a series of selectors and a set of things that I want to set on those selectors. And one of the nice things that you're going to notice is when we were learning DOM programming, we learned about how to use query string or sorry, how to use query selector and how to use query selector all in order to pick 
all of these different elements in the DOM to, to do something with them. And the selectors that we're working with when we're using query selector are the same selectors that we're working with in CSS. So there's some nice crossover there when you're trying to think about how am I gonna talk about these elements that are in the DOM. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about where to put, where to put your styles, okay? So the thing about CSS is that it, it gets applied in layers or there is specificity to how it's going to apply things or there's rules for what trumps something else in terms of what gets done in the page, okay? So if you don't, I'll go from the bottom up. If you don't do anything in the page at all, what's gonna happen is the browser is gonna apply its default set of styles. So for example, I, I'm talking about this page here that I wanna style. And this page, for all intents and purposes, has no styles applied to it. And yet, if you look at it, it does actually have some styles applied to it because our titles are bigger. You can see that there, there's a particular font that's been chosen. So how did those decisions get made? What is the baseline set of CSS that gets applied to my page? If I don't put anything in, what makes a link blue and underlined, for example? What makes a heading this size? Like, why is it so big? So what happens is each browser has a defined set of styles and I'll show you. So here on GitHub, I can take a look at the styles for, this is in this case for Firefox. And this is the, the default style sheet that Firefox uses and every browser has a slightly different version of this, which I'll come back to in a second. But if I go looking for the H1 tag, for example, here it is. So the H1 tag has its font size set to 2EM, whereas the H2 tag has its font size set uh, 1.5, H3, 1.17, etc., all the way down. So this is why all of those different headings have a slightly smaller size by default when they get done in the browser. Every one of the elements is getting its rules from the browser's default styles that are put into the page. So what a lot of people have done is uh, they've said, you know what, I don't like the default set of, of styles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to quote unquote normalize my styles. So a lot of people will include a style sheet, normalize.css, which is what I'm showing you here. And what it does is it smooths out the differences between these different browsers. So if you open the page in Safari versus Firefox versus Chrome versus whatever, it will apply a default set of styles. And so it's often the case that people will include, there's quite a few of them, but this is an example. They'll include a style sheet that says, you know, these are the rules that I want to have applied by default. I want, you know, I want the body to have a margin of zero, just as a, you know, I want that to be, I want to override what the basic styles are in the page, okay? So that takes us to our next layer up. The next layer up is an external file. So when I talk to you about normalize.css, I'm talking about loading an external file, which is going to get applied to this page, an external CSS file, which is going to get used with the HTML on this page in order to generate how it gets rendered. So we can use an external file, and there's a couple of ways that we can include an external file. So you know, you know, if we wanted to include a script, we, we include a script by saying script source equals. Well, when we want to include an external file, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the link element. So the link element needs to go in the head. So we define our CSS up at the top of our page. And we say, I want to load this style sheet and I want to include this style, style sheet in the page. So it gets loaded in the head. It's not visual content. It's not part of the body. It's something that's being loaded when the page gets loaded and it's loaded very early on. So the syntax for this looks like the following. You specify that you want to, you want to link a resource to this page. You can link lots of different kinds of resources. And what we want to link right now is a style sheet. 
So what you have to do is you have to spe specify the relationship of this resource at the URL you're gonna give. What is the relationship to this page? Well, in this case, it's a style sheet. So we say we're gonna link a style sheet to this document and the URL for this style sheet is whatever you put in the href. So when you're trying to remember between script source equals, well, here we have to do link href equals. They're similar, but not identical. So be, remember that when you're trying to do this. It's also a good idea for you to specify a MIME type. So we're saying to the browser, this thing that we're gonna download is fundamentally text, but it is a specific kind of text. It is a CSS file. So this is how we would load a style sheet and our style sheet is styles.css. And the way that the browser would interpret this is it would say, I'm gonna look for a style sheet which is relative to the current document. So I'm gonna go and look for something that's beside my index.html and it's gonna be called styles.css. I'm gonna try and link it into this page or I'm gonna download it and I'm gonna look at it. Look at it that way. Here's another example. In this case, I've got two style sheets being loaded. So you can load as many as you want. Some pages will load, uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight. You could load lots and lots of different style sheets from all different places all over the web. And that's exactly what's happening here. So you can see that we have two link elements. The second link element defines a relative URL to the web server, to this current web page, styles.css. However, this, the first one, is an absolute URL that starts to take us out to a new location, stackpath.bootstrapcdn.com, and it's gonna load, it's gonna load this file here, like so. And if we just take a look at this, let's see what this file looks like. So here's a CSS file that we're loading, and you'll notice that this CSS file doesn't look like the CSS I was just showing you a second ago. Like up here, this is what CSS is supposed to look like, and this is what this CSS looks like. So what you'll notice if you look inside the URL bar here, it says that this is a minified file. So this file has had all of the white space stripped out of it. They have compressed it down so that it has all the same content. However, they've made it so that it'll be a little bit smaller on the wire when they're downloading this file. So if somebody hosts a CSS file on the web, you can link to it and you can, in, you can have it be linked to your page the way that I'm link, you know, linking to here. So these things come in that way. There is actually another way to load an external, file, external style sheet. And that is you can use the import statement at the top of your CSS file. You could say, I want to import another CSS file. So the difference between these two is, if you load a style sheet like this, you can import another style sheet inside it, as opposed to having to load multiple style sheets like this. So you'll see both of these techniques get used extensively, and I'll give you a demonstration of using both of them when we recreate that New Yorker article. So another thing to note about these external style sheets, and that is that external style sheets like this can be cached. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna inspect this page that we're on right now, and I'm gonna go to the network tab, and I'm gonna reload this page. And what you're gonna see here is that it has loaded my HTML document. So this is the, this is the HTTP, or sorry, the HTML document that's being sent to me. And then the first thing that it loads after that is this style sheet. And you can see that here's the style sheet. Again, it's all been, it's all been compressed and minified. I can expand it out so you could see what it would look like here. But I want you to notice how it was loaded. So you'll notice over here in terms of size, what does it say? It says that it's coming out of cache. So the browser has already loaded this page in the past. And it says, I'm going to, instead of reloading this, I'm just gonna get this out of cache. So I'm not gonna bother downloading it again because I already have it saved. So one of the nice things about working with external style sheets is you can cache them. And that's very good, especially on mobile or slower networks, slower devices where you don't wanna do lots and lots of network requests to download files that aren't necessary to be downloaded. 
One last thing to note about this, you'll notice that this file is being loaded from a CDN. So the concept of a CDN is that I take a, let me, let me actually show you an image. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Let's see if I can find, yeah, here's a good one. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, the concept of a CDN is I am in Brazil or I am in the UK or I am in uh, wherever. I'm somewhere in the world and I want to load a resource from a server. And so if the server is on the other side of the world, for me, if it's in Australia, I have to go all the way to Australia and back in order to get that resource. So another thing we could do is we could put a copy of our content out across a whole bunch of servers that are connected together. When the user requests a page, what's gonna happen is, depending where they are geographically, they're gonna get redirected to the closest server that this CDN has available to it. You know, so if I'm in Asia and I were to request a document, instead of having to go over to a server in the US, I could get that, I could get it closer to home, which means it's gonna load faster. So what a lot of times what we do is we host static content like CSS files, JavaScript files, images, etc. We put them on CDNs and these CDNs are very fast networks and they're globally distributed and it makes it a lot faster for people to load them. Another thing that happens is that because people are loading these style sheets, like for example, the bootstrap um, style sheet, because they load it from a CDN instead of from your web server, the chances are that they might already have this same URL in their cache from somebody else's website. So if you share resources via a CDN, there's a good chance that people will get this extra benefit that the file will be repeated across multiple sites. And this happens with fonts and all sorts of things, JavaScript files, CSS files um, that people end up sharing. Okay, so continuing on here, where are we? The browser has its own styles, so that's the base. The browser allows us to link to or import external style sheets that we can override the base styles of the browser itself. What's next? Well, in terms of specificity, you can also do internal uh, styles inside of the page. So let me show you an example of what that looks like. Um, here's one here. So much as I can with the script element, where with a script element, you can have JavaScript that's a little snippet of code inside of a script element. I can do the same thing with CSS. I can put CSS into a style element. Again, you would typically put these in the head of the document, that's where they belong. And you can provide extra styles that need to be included with the web page. So the downside of doing this is that they can't be cached. So if you put the styles into the HTML document, so if I put styles here in, um, in the head of my document, they're gonna get downloaded with the document every time the document gets downloaded. The benefit is you have them immediately. You don't have to go off and load them. So people tend to use this when they want to put styles in for startup. So if you have, for example, a loading spinner or you have some sort of startup CSS, some very like a bare minimum set of styles that are really important to show to the user before your other style sheets load, or if your other style sheets don't load, people will sometimes put styles in here in these blocks. When you're developing a website, it's common to use this as well as a way of saying, I just wanna quickly hack something up and I wanna see what would happen if I put these styles into my page. And so you'll see me do it, you'll do it too when you're debugging, but when you're building production grade services or websites, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. If I were you, I would put things in external files. It's really much easier for tools to work on the CSS when it's in an external file versus inside of a embed, inside of, um, inside of your document. So put everything that is, is, is CSS into a .css file, everything that's JS into a .js file. All the things I'm talking about also apply to, also apply the same to um, 
JavaScript files. Okay, one last thing I wanna mention here, where else can you put things? So you can put things in line in an element and you shouldn't do that. You really shouldn't do this either, but I'll show you how you do it. So what does it look like? Here's an example that says, I would like to have the background color of this div set to green. So what does it look like to, to do this? So how do, we, how do we apply a background color in CSS? We do this, we, we put a selector and we say, I want the background color for this div to be blue, green, whatever. Up here, you'll notice the difference is that I don't have a selector. So all I have is I have a key value pair that says set this property to be this value. I don't need a selector because it applies only to the element on which you're placing the style attribute. So it's, it's incredibly handy because if you want to directly target something, you can just stick it directly onto an element and say, I want this to be green or whatever. The downside of this is that it becomes very difficult to maintain. So you have to repeat. So imagine if I have all sorts of things and I have a bunch of these divs and I want them all to be green. That means I have to go and put green, green, green. I have to do it everywhere. And you show it to your client or to your boss and your boss says, you know what? That green is not the right green. I want you to change, it's too dark, make it lighter. So now you have to go back and find all those greens and change it a whole bunch of times. And it becomes, it becomes something where you've repeated yourself too many times in the file, you've spread your CSS all over the place, and you've mixed your HTML, which remember is about semantic content and meaning. And here what you've done is you've started to put style into there. So you don't really want HTML to include style. It sounds odd because in your head you're thinking about, here's what I wanna say and here's how I want it to look. But you really wanna try and find a way to, to break those two things apart, let the CSS be about how it looks and let the, um, let the HTML, HTML be about the content, okay? So again, if we, if we take a look at this page here, let, let me show you a couple things while we're looking at this. We've been talking about the, the dev tools and how we target things inside of the browser here. So if I were to, like as an example, if I were to click on this background color green, which ironically is red. And um, how, how was this achieved? So in the dev tools, what do we see? We can see that we have here, we have a span and the span has a class on it. Class equals S, presumably class equals string. So GitHub is producing this red string in the syntax highlighting in their HTML by applying a class, class equals S, and then they have the content that's in inside here. Over here on the right, we have another part of the inspector that we haven't really been working with too much yet. And that is we can take a look at the style information that's available to us for any element that we pick in the DOM. So if I, scroll through this list, you'll see lots and lots and lots of different styles that are being applied and they're all broken up into different sections. So at the very top, it says element.style. If you click here, it's possible for you to put your own styles on this just to see what would happen. So as an example, if I said background color is yellow, you can see that as I'm typing, that change is directly happening in the DOM. Well, how does the DevTools do that? If you look at what's happened over here with the element, you can see that a new style attribute, an inline style attribute has been added to this element, which is why this works. So if I come here and I turn this off, the browser will remove it. In this case, it comments it out. If I turn it back on, it comes back on this way. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing an example of this specificity where if I put something on the elements style directly, so if I just embed it into the attribute of the element, it will show up above all other things. It'll trump everything else. Like if I were to say color is blue, you'll notice that the color is now blue, even though the color is supposed to be red. But because I am in a more specific location, I'm applying these styles directly into the element, it's taking what I'm saying and applying that. 
Okay, so why is this color red, right? Why, why have they been able to make this red? So over here, you go further down and it says dot highlight dot S, and then it shows you the color is equal to this color right here. And if I turn this off, you'll see that the color goes back to the default color, the inherited color black in this case. So this is where this is coming from. And when I say this is where it's coming from, I also have the information here over on the right, there's a link and it says, this is the line of code from the CSS file that is causing this to happen. And if I click here, it's gonna take me into this file. Now the file is minified. So I'm gonna go down to the bottom left and I'm going to ask it to expand the file out for me, put all of the, like reformat it so that I can read it. And you'll see that this right here is why that is red, why, it's ha why it has the color being applied to it. So if we look at what this says, we have two different classes here that are being used in a contextual selector. And so when you, when you read through the notes, I'm not gonna go through all of that right now. We talk about all the different selector types, but let's think about what we know how to do. We know how to talk about, for example, elements by their type, by their tag name. So if I say image, that is a selector that means give me all of the images or all of the paragraphs or whatever. We know how to specify that we want to select something based on its ID. So if I say, hash output, what I really mean is find me an element whose ID is equal to output. And finally, from our time working with the DOM, we also talked about doing dot logo, meaning find me something that has a class of logo. So recall that an ID is unique. There's only one of them in the DOM. There should only be one of them in the DOM unless you've messed up and it's it's unique, it's this one element that has a name. A class is a way of saying that this element is like other elements that I want to put into a class. I want to put together, I wanna to make a category or I wanna make a group of elements and I wanna apply a set of styles to all of these elements. So if we went, for example, and we said selector all, and if I said, give me all the dot S elements, there's 21 of them. So you can see that there's a whole bunch of different spans. Like I'd have to scroll up to get to one. Let's see if we can find one here. Like these right here, you can see as I move my mouse there, there's one. So this is a span that has the class S on it. And here's another one that has the class S on it, etc. And it's also possible for us to stack those together. So you'll notice, for example, that it says, I have a class, this div has a class of highlight. And inside of this class, there is another element that has the class highlight. Inside of this is a code, inside of this is something with CP. So if I wanted to say, I wanna find all of the elements of with a class of CP, but they have to be inside of a highlight class, the way that I would write this I would say dot highlight, meaning get me all of the elements that have the highlight class, and then I would say dot whatever, CP, and give me, give me those. So the space here, meaning give me everything that, uh, this is a, a child of the highlight. So again, all of this is in the notes for this week. So I would encourage you, I'm not gonna go through and look at all of the different pieces of the selectors, but we list all of them, tag selectors, class selectors, ID selectors, contextual selectors. There's quite a few different ones to learn. As I said previously, the, the benefit of learning these is that you can use them in JS and you can use them in CSS. So you have, you have access to be able to do, uh, do lots with them here when you're looking at it. Um, okay, another quick note here that of things that you're gonna see happening a lot when we look at other pages and as we start to build our own pages. And uh, the first is that people are going to 
place content inside of containers with the sole purpose of defining styles. So it's gonna become very common for you to see this pattern where we'll have a bunch of content and we will wrap it inside of an element. It could be a div, it could be a main, it could be a section, it could, there's lots of things that we could use. But if we need a block level element that contains a bunch of other elements that we wanna style, you'll see that it's very common for people to wrap that in a div and give it an ID or give it a class. And similarly, you'll also see them do the same thing with inline elements. So here's an example where we want to do something specific to the name portion of the paragraph. So what do we do? How do we target that with CSS? We have to wrap that in an element. So we wrap that in an element and you can see here how we select it. So make that bold, make that bold, info box span, make it bold. Okay. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause this discussion. In the next video, what I wanna do is I wanna show you a couple of websites that just take you through and show you how you would tear apart somebody else's website. And then I'm gonna do one more on showing you how to rebuild uh, that New Yorker article. So I'll pause there and encourage you to go through these notes in detail on your own. And I'm going to, rather than say this does this, this does this, I'm gonna show you live examples. We're gonna code it together and I think that'll make it easier.